law in our culture and, are, and it's rooted in biblical values. These are the things that have made this a great nation, along with property rights and free market capitalism, the rule of law, which is God's law transferred into this country. And so today it brings us to this point, this, this point of the subject of um, the, the law itself and how it's interpreted, how the Constitution is interpreted, the profound constitutional questions, and how the laws that are written within the parameters of the Constitution are interpreted, and how the president himself is advised by the Office of Legal Counsel. And I will submit that the president's appointment to the Office of Legal Counsel is one of the most important appointments that is ever made. And it's an appointment that, um, according to the uh, Newsweek magazine, the Office of Legal Counsel is the most important government office you've never heard of. This is the job that advises the president on, and uh, other branches of government on all constitutional questions, evaluates executive orders as their constitutionality, and anything that might come before the president for a signature or a piece of legislation that would come out of here, for example, Madam Speaker, that's, um, that's also something that would call, come under the purview of the Office of Legal Counsel. The president issued, um, he rescinded the, uh, the Mexico City policy on January 23rd of this year, uh, and that Mexico City policy is a policy that prohibited federal dollars, our tax dollars, yours and mine, and everybody across this country, from being used to fund abortions overseas. That's the Mexico City policy. I think the president wanted to issue his executive order on January 22nd, the anniversary of Roe versus Wade, uh, but out of respect for the hundreds of thousands of Americans that poured into this city to make their case about the protection of innocent unborn human life, I think out of the fair backlash, plus he was a little busy signing his executive order that closes Gitmo a year to the day. It will be on the anniversary of Roe versus Wade in 2010. But on January 23rd, the next day, he issued the executive order that rescinded the Mexico City, City policy, opened up the door to compel American taxpayers to fund abortions in foreign countries under the guise of what should we call it, population control, um, reproductive rights. It is, um, and, and then on top of that, we have the appointment of, um, of Don Johnson to the Office of Legal Counsel to advise the president on executive orders, constitutional questions, and someone who comes to this job with a real track record, a track record of a built-in bias, as, a, as an assistant to the Office of Legal Counsel under, uh, under President Clinton, and someone who has made a whole series of outrageous statements, most of them have come in conjunction with her doing her job as a, as a legal counsel herself. So these are not, this is not talk that's coming along in the coffee shop. This is language that flows out of legal briefs that she has written. And if and, we could just speak a little bit more about the importance of this office, the Office of Legal Counsel. The gentleman had quoted from Newsweek magazine. Newsweek went on to say that this role as Office of Legal Counsel acts as a kind of mini Supreme Court. This office it is the president's uh, legal counsel for all practical purposes. They issue opinions, much like judicial opinions, it, a kind of su mini Supreme Court. And Newsweek went on to say its carefully worded opinions are regarded as binding precedent, as final say on what the president and all his agencies can and cannot legally do. I can't think of a more important office to whisper into the president's ear about where the president will come down and stand on issues. The other thing to recognize, the Office of Legal Counsel is a training ground, so to speak, for future Supreme Court justices. This individual that the president has nominated for this position, previous occupants were Antonin Scalia, William Rehnquist. This is very important that we know who this person is that will be whispering into the president's ear. For my time, I thank the gentlelady for that uh, further clarification of the Office of Legal Counsel, that most important government office that most have never heard of, Madam Speaker. And so as, as we saw this appointment be made and uh, looked through some of the documentation of Don Johnson, we put together a letter to the president. And uh, this letter is dated March 24th. Uh, of this year, and it's and, and it's there are 62 co-signers on here, uh, both of us, uh, Michelle Bachman, myself included, and uh, it addresses a letter to the president, and it says, uh, essentially, Mr. President, you stated with when you rescinded the Mexico City policy that no matter what our views, 
we are united in our determination, and this is a continuing quote, um, to prevent unintended pregnancies, reduce the need for abortion, and support women and families in the choices they make. I'll just close that quote there. Um, if it's your intent, Mr. President, that we really reach for those kind of goals, and another component of that statement would be we must work to find common ground. Close quote. I hope the president picks up on this. There is no way to find common ground with an individual who holds such utterly biased views. And this is, in my judgment, one of them. And this is a, this is a quote from Don Johnson. And uh, the notion of legal restrictions as some kind of a reasonable compromise compromise, perhaps to help make abortion safe, legal, and rare, which is a statement that has come out of uh, many leading Democrats, including Hillary Clinton. This proves to be nonsensical in her view, and I think it's the rare part that she objects, so much, objects so much to. And she goes on to, uh, to quote in a different location, progressive must not portray all abortions as tragedies, absent unfor unforeseen Technolo technological and medical changes, abortion is unlikely to become truly rare and certainly not non-existent. In other words, this is a rejection uh, of the position, the, the most, uh, I will say, the most friendly position that I get from people that, are, that do not support the protection of innocent unborn human life. At least they will concede that, they, that there's a moral abhorrence to it and it should be minimized if they aren't willing to eliminate it. And that was something that Hillary Clinton said, but um, this statement by Don Johnson I think makes it clear, uh, Madam Speaker, that she says that abortion will never be rare and uh, safe, legal, and rare, as a matter of fact, it will not be. And that just opens up the door to further dialogue on this, on this particular issue. There are many issues that, that I would object to, but I, I focus this on the, on the abortion side. And another one of these statements uh, that we carry to the president is this. And this, uh, Madam Speaker, is among the most offensive statements that the American people are asked to accept uh, as part, uh, part and parcel of the package that you get when the president appoints someone to be to head of the op Office of Legal Counsel who carries this kind of a bias against the people who stand up for innocent human life. And this is her statement on abortion regulation. The state has conscripted her body for its own ends because the state has an interest in babies being born uh, if a state is not interested in that, you will see a civilization ultimately die. Um, so she was recognizing a compelling state interest in protecting the fetus would provide states with an open-ended invitation to force pregnant women to act in whatever ways the state determined were optimal for the fetus. Thereby, and I pay attention to this, thereby reducing pregnant women to no more than fetal containers. That is a remark of contempt towards mothers, towards the cherished role that they have uh, in bringing these young children to birth and nurturing them with all the love they possibly can. It's offensive to me to think that someone has called my mother a fetal container. If I, if I could add to the gentleman's remarks, I think that the other thing that is glaring in this statement by Ms. Johnson is the fact that she said, recognizing a compelling state interest in protecting the fetus. I'd just like to remind her that the state is not only interested in protecting the fetus, the state is also interested in protecting the woman. Many states all across the United States of America have laws known as women's right to know because there's, there's an there's an intention that women who are abortion-minded know what the consequence of that decision will mean. Many women become infertile for life. Once they have a, an abortion, they can never bear another child after that. And many women don't know what the consequences of an early abortion will be. That's a violent act. An abortion is a violent act to a woman's body. Also, women have tremendous emotional pain that may, they may 
deal with not just for an afternoon or not just for a weekend. They may, for the next 10 years, suffer with depression and all manner of uh, uh, disorders that they may have to deal with emotionally for years and years because they didn't fully comprehend the consequences of their decision. And while women should never be viewed as fetal containers, I've never heard any more crass language in my life than the imagery that Don Johnson brought up, it's also true that babies are more than a product of tissue. Babies are a gift. Just as women are a gift, babies are a gift. Human life is to be cherished, not discarded. And in, in reclaiming my time from the gentlelady from Minnesota who has lived her life in demonstration of that commitment to life, uh, your own children and the numbers of foster children that uh, you have nurtured, um, you're the woman that lives in Minnesota and had so many children but always knew what to do. <laughs> and um, I've not quite figured out how to put that into the proper alliteration, but that's the concept. That we had great kids <laughs> represent King. That's how we did it. We had the great kids I and had a great met. husband and a great husband. <laughs> it, uh, it definitely helps to have a good husband. I remind my wife of that, and I appreciate that comment. Uh, going back to this, um, as you mentioned, uh, it was a, the Office of Legal Counsel is a perfect position to whisper things into the ears of the president, to get the president's attention, to be on his agenda, to make legal arguments, to make the uh, arguments that are going to help him rationalize and set the policy. And the to policy make his like state and to City. help him make him statements to make his statements for him. Because these are written statements that become binding president precedent within the president's office. This is an amazing amount of power. Written statements with binding precedent and the ability to write that into statements or whisper in to the president's ear, fetal containers, And to bind Mr. the president. agencies. It also binds the administrative agencies. So this, is, this has power throughout the entire presidential administration. Every agency, every department would be bound by these statements. And it, and it would limit the ability of each of the agencies to react to the very policy that this Congress has established, or this Congress might establish. And uh, this kind of pejorative language has no place in law. And it has no place in the dialogue of America. It has no place in families and humanity. It has no place in nurturing little children. And it has no place in uh, taking care of the mothers, the brothers, and the sisters um, of the idea that a fetal container, that reduces the unborn child, that innocent little baby, to being a term that hardly makes it as a medical term. Now, these aren't the only comments that have been made um, by Don Johnson. I just pick them up as they as they come along there's quite a stack here and I don't know if I'll get through them all uh, Madam Speaker but here's one that's um, also indicative of a similar kind of language in the previous quote where Don Johnson uh, again the president's appointee to head up the office of legal counsel um, the the argument says the argument that women who become pregnant have in some sense consented to the pregnancy belies reality I'd like to think that most women who are mothers have consented to the pregnancy. Uh, not all, but most. The large number of women who never receive proper information about contraception and others who are the inevitable losers in the contraception lottery no more consent to pregnancy than, a, than pedestrians consent to being struck by drunk drivers. Pregnant mothers? equivalent to being struck by drug, drunk drivers when they, are, when they become pregnant, that reduces this thing down into an act of almost negligent violence, if not willful violence. I think it's an act of love. It almost seems contrary to feminism, because feminism empowers women and believes that women have the capability to give consent, inform consent. And the way that this is written by Dawn Johnson, it appears that she's saying that women are without capacity to give consent, even in an area of becoming pregnant. And, and McClain, Mom, even when, even when they, they make that decision themselves, and uh, I, as, a, as a new grandfather myself, um, three weeks ago today, uh, I think of those children that are loved and wanted and planned and those families that aren't able to have children that are lined up to adopt children that might become available. There are many more families in this country that are waiting prayerfully for a child to come along that they can adopt and, and nurture into the bosom of their family and raise them as one of their own 
than there are unwanted children and in this I country. And if I could just correct the gentleman, my opinion is that every child is a wanted child. That is one of Planned Parenthood's trademarks that I believe is one of the biggest myths that's been perpetrated in the last 40 years. Every child a wanted child, oh, as God. if there are unwanted children. Every child is a wanted child. I can attest to the fact that there are open arms for every child that's born. If a child is considered less than perfect, has a physical or a mental disability, 